Okay, let's finally do a demo here. I had a serious house project that demanded all my attention and time, and it took me over a month to complete. I had to do it. And then after that, I got a new PC, and I wanted to bring that up because I went from an i7 7th generation GTX 1060 to an i9 13th generation RTX 4080. And there is a serious difference between the two. Now, the reason why I brought that up is because in the past, I actually had to take three or four minutes of color and water mixing and then take it 20, 30, even 40 times its original speed just to reduce it down to 20 or 30 seconds, make it somewhat watchable. Now, everything happens just about that fast in real time. So I have to keep my finger on that F button to make sure I fast dry as soon as I need it. Now, the big reason why I brought this up is when you're watching some of these demos, could be from anybody, make sure you understand that what you're seeing happening might be just because of the speed of their machine versus yours. Now that I had two different machines to compare, I could see a lot difference in the two machines and how my watercolors react and how they work. Uh, this makes it much easier for me. It's very nice to work with. Everything happens very quick. I don't have to wait. So now, let's go ahead and start this painting. Before we draw out this bird, I just want to go over through some Photography 101. This demo is all about duplicating your photograph onto your paper or canvas. However, you have to make sure that your photograph is exactly how you want your painting to be. Usually when you use cell phones, they are commonly set at wide angle or ultra wide angle. This gives the user the benefit of having sharp photos from foreground to background with very little photography experience needed. However, what a wide or even especially an ultra wide angle setting will do is really exaggerate your proportions. I want to bring out a couple of photos and just go over a couple of quick things, but I will put up a demo that I did for just photography and it will give you a good idea of how many limitations there are in a camera. Now this goes back to drawing from a photograph is quite different from drawing realistic. Realistic, your proportions, your perspective are going to be one way. And if you use a wide angle to an ultra wide angle lens, the perspective and proportions may be something completely different. They will be exaggerated. So drawing from a photograph, then you should have some background information or an understanding of how the photograph was shot. Let's take a look at these photos. Okay, let me close this out, which is right here, and then we'll close that. And then these are the photos right here. And I just wanted you to just keep in mind the notes I'm going to write on them, just to show you the difference. Now we'll open up the first one here, Okay, this guy is going to go in motion out this way, and then he's going to go on for a quick screen. Oh, wait, never mind. That's uh, the wrong photo. Sorry. <laughs> okay, just a little Super Bowl humor. I couldn't resist. Now, we'll go into the photos that I do want to show you, and they will have some proportion or perspective exaggerations that you may want to note. If you want to copy your photograph exactly, then you may have to keep these things in mind, because depending on how you have your camera lens selection set, then it may be obvious, but then it may be just subtly wrong. And if your painting doesn't look right, it is because you copied the photograph exactly. Now let's open up the first one and I will enlarge a little bit so we can see what we're doing here. Now we all know that branches get thinner as they go away from the trunk. But in this particular case, because this branch right here is coming out at me, and all the other ones are fairly parallel to the film plane, so to speak, then this one is exaggerated because of the wide angle lens I used. Up in here at the very edge is actually wider, a good bit wider, thicker, than where it attaches to the trunk down here. And because of that, I would correct that if I was using this as a, as a reference photograph. Now, other ones, we could go to the next one. These photos will have the same problem. I'll turn this one off, turn this one on. Now this is the same thing. 
this old truck I photographed just along the road. It made an interesting reference. But then again, now look at this fender here compared to this fender here. Because I had the camera just a little bit left of the truck, the edge of the truck, then what it did was it actually made this fender a lot smaller than this fender. And if you follow the, the converging lines of where the fenders should be, then this is a very forced perspective picture. If you want that perspective angle in your painting, then that's fine. Uh, you will be duplicating the photograph just as it is. But you may want your truck to look more natural, so you have to be careful. What would normally happen is you would just step away from your object further and photograph it with maybe, say, a 50 millimeter lens, and that would portray it as what the human eye sees, hence why they call a 50 millimeter lens the normal, only because it sees what the human eye sees, about a 46 degree angle. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, this next one will be obvious too, and this is it right here, but then I'll back it off since it's a vertical. The back of the boat is very close to me. Look how wide it is compared to the front. But then keep in mind, this is a man door, and look how small it is in proportion with the rest of the boat. Uh, this, this distance here, from here to here, is very much exaggerated compared to the rest of the boat and it's making this man door look very small so because of that it is really making this part of the boat very exaggerated even compared to the boat next to it because this part of the boat is closer to us then this part is overly exaggerated very small because of the forced perspective just keep these things in mind as you're drawing from your photograph that if you want to duplicate the photograph exactly, then that would be a good idea to have an accurate photograph to begin with as to how you want to paint. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, I went ahead and closed everything out just so we could start from the beginning. We'll have just a couple of things to go over here before we start drawing. And that is we want to open up our reference images. So all we have to do is go up to here, our window, hit that. And when it drops down, go to reference images, click on that. And then our reference image panel will come up. And then to bring up a photo, we hit this button right here. Click on that. And that will take you inside your PC, Mac, whatever you're working on. So you can find your reference images wherever you may have them stored. Click on the ones you need, especially if you need more than one. And then open them. And then it will come up into your reference image panel. And then now it's going to be turned off. So if you turn it on, just click it one more time, and it will open up its own panel. And we're going to do this about right here and open this up just pretty big. And we're going to talk about a few things here. Now, if I want to hide this panel and I'm working and I don't need it anymore, then I could just click this button right here, and then it will hide it or show it. And then if I want to delete the image, I could delete it with this button right here and that will remove the image out of my reference image panel. Now, with this particular photo, we're going to be drawing it three different ways, and what I wanna do is just show you, these are the two controls we're gonna be using here, this one and this one go together, and then this one and this one go together. Now, just spoiler alert, I have a rather drawn out demo that's just about done. Uh, I have to finish painting it. It's on one layer only, so it's going to be like a traditional painting of the grapes I did a while back, but it was only a speed painting, and I didn't explain anything. Now, with this drawing and painting, uh, this one's going to be rather loose, and we'll just do it just to get it started, but we're going to do this three different ways drawing uh, just to see however you want to try and start drawing it yourself. Now, this button right here, when I click this button, this one takes the photo right to the painting. Now keep in mind, this one right here beside it allows you to resize the photo on your canvas or paper, whatever size you need to make it. But with this particular setup, I'm working on an eight by 12 paper that is just the handmade arches. And I also just have an eight by 12, 300 DPI photograph. So they're identical in size. Now, I'll turn that off using this button right here. We don't need to resize it. 
And then these two right here are going to draw us guides. This is when we will go to the guide section. I'm going to freehand it on the bottom layer and with no help at all, just drawing right from it. But we're gonna go over a couple things here before I start freehanding. And then the next one is gonna be guides. And that is what we'll use this button and this button for. We're gonna draw our guides and then the final layer, we're going to trace it. And what we'll do is put me to the test and we're gonna turn on all three of those layers and compare them and just see how well they match up, depending on how you would want to draw this. If I draw this in freehand, what I wanna do is start making mental vertical lines and horizontal lines on this photograph. In other words, number one is where this branch comes down, what is this size from here to here compared to this size from here to here? And that will give me a good idea of placement of where this branch has to come down. And then what angle is that branch? Is it about a 45? It looks like it's a little bit steeper. 45 would be kind of like this way. And this would be like maybe 50, 55. And I try to imagine all these things. Then where is the center of my photograph? If I come down this way, this maybe right in here would be center. And then just about the top of the head is pretty close to center. And all of these reference points mental uh, I make for myself just to give me a rough idea that if I look at the eye, if I follow the point of the eye straight out, it's pretty much right at the point of the beak. And then depending on where its cap is, which is this just this little part of red here, that's just a cap. And then the bottom of the beak, how it comes out and it comes in a little bit and then down. And then you could see that the beak top beak has a slight curve to it. It starts out and then goes down. All of these angles, very subtle, but very important. I like to do my drawings as accurate as I can, especially traditionally on paper, because once I commit to paint, it's a transparent watercolor. I stress that over and over. I cannot go back and change things such as shapes uh, or even uh, rearrange uh, anything only because once I start putting down my light blue sky and everything else, uh, lighter colors in the picture are just a quick dab of color, and then that's it. That They're done. The, everything else is the white of the paper. Now, in this right here, the sumac, uh, this is a little wee bit left of center. I would say the center is about right in here where the white arrow is. And then I'll make this just a little wee bit, but we're going to make this a real strong texture. So all I will do is just more or less make like just like an oblong shape that will just represent where I'm going to put uh, the seeds of the sumac. And then uh, draw in a couple of these branches. Now something such as that don't have to be critical because they grow so sporadic. Uh, you're not going to be held to that, but only the uh, proportions of the bird uh, stay very consistent and that's what I'll concentrate on the most when I freehand it. Now with those things in mind we're going to go ahead and freehand this out and then we'll go over the guides next and then we'll just trace it and compare all three. Let's go ahead and freehand this out and I'll just do that speed drawing. Total draw time is a little under 13 minutes and because I photographed this bird with a 300-2.8 and a 1.4x converter I know that the perspective and proportions are exactly how I'd want them. When I'm drawing this out, I'm just looking at all my positive and negative spaces compared to each other. I made the bill a little bit too big, so I resized it, and I want to go over that in more detail of what I did. Let's take a look. Okay, that's about it for the free hand. Uh, I have a couple issues. Uh, the eye, a little bit too much like a football. Uh, the tail, this end right here, is a little wee bit too far to the left. It should be more to the right. Then I already changed uh, the negative space within the leg and the branch. Looks a little bit better now. Uh, but we will uh, define that further when we compare all three. Now I'm going to do the guides in blue. So we have a different set of lines for each way we draw this out. And I am going to move this over here. And then we will bring our photo back over. I had it on another monitor. Okay, now what I will do is first show you that if you want to use the guide system to make a guide, we could do that anywhere we want on this picture, but then if you want a point, you could just crisscross guides. If you want just an edge to know where your edge is, then you could just draw one line. But this one right here will allow you to draw the lines 
and then this one right here will show guides or hide guides so one thing for sure make sure that when you put your photo which is right here show your photo on your canvas or your paper it is the way you would want it so in other words if you paint this it's just the exact same size as the paper and that's how i would want it so when i start drawing my guides uh, that's how big it will be on my canvas or paper so now I know that that's the way I would want it drawn. Now if I start using guides, just for, for example, if I want to know where this edge is or this edge right here, if I draw a line from here and then hold my left click key down and then just release it right there, now it's putting a line right here where that edge is. So now I know where that edge is. Say, for example, I want to know where the edge of the bird is right here. If I do the same thing, I go from here, then maybe to here, and that's just roughly where it's at. And I can move it. All I have to do, and when it turns yellow and it, it has moving icon on it, then I can move it down a little bit. Now, this over here is where that chest and side of the wing would be on my painting. If I want to know like where the eye is, even especially the center of the eye, then I could just take one line here and move it to there and then take another one from here and move it down and make an X plus sign technically leave it there and then that's where my eye would be right there at this point right here all I'm doing is transferring all these uh, facts and figures so to speak onto my paper so now if I want to know where the edge of the sumac is I can make another line right here that's where the edge is. Here's where the next edge is. And that's how wide my sumac should be. Now, if I want to know where this starts right here, I can make uh, little reference points. If I want to know where the back of the head is, I can make another one right there. And that's the size of the bird where it would be. And this would be the eye. If I want to make the top of the head where it would be, there's where the top of the head would be. So now keep in mind, the more I make marks on my photograph that would be the guides the closer i am to just about pretty much getting to trace it so that's okay that will help you freehand that will help you keep everything in proportion the way you want if you want your drawing exactly like your photograph now with that in mind i can make a couple other lines and then we could go ahead uh just say for example right here just a short line where the one toe would be that would be right here and then where this toe would be, right there. And then I can even make the line right here as long as the toe is, minus the toenail. And this way, I'll know even how long to make that toe on the branch. And this will also tell me roughly uh, how thick the branch will have to be on, on this side of my line over here. And then this will just give me reference points to help keep me in proportion compared to my photograph now with all that in mind uh, let's go ahead and do this out we have a good idea of how to do our guides to set up our guides and then what we could do is go ahead and speed draw this one now too then we could go to the uh, trace and that would be it let's go ahead and speed draw this out I went ahead and added a few more guides just to mark where the beak starts and then also just a few more for the sumac itself. If you strategically place your guides, not only will you mark the edge of something, but you can also mark the beginning and end of other objects within your photo. Let's take a look and see what we have, and we'll further discuss this in detail. Okay, that completes the guides drawing. We'll move on to the tracing and then compare all three. Let's do the tracing. Oh, the hot tip for the day is if you forget to pick the blue color, you could use the transparency lock and still change the color of your line. Let's take a look. Okay, let's take a look and see what we have with all three drawings. Uh, they are quite different. One completely freehand, the other one uh, freehand but with guides, and then the other one with tracing. Now, we know the tracing is going to be the most accurate. Uh, let's compare it to the guides. I'll turn that one on, and that the guides didn't come out too bad at all. I, I try to keep my guides to a minimum and still do some freehand uh, here and there. But again, 
like say for example when I was working on some of these lines and some of the guides right in here if I put a guide down from here to here then not only will that define the edge of my Schumach but it will also tell me where to start this branch at and where to start this branch at and then that way just one guide could give you several reference points depending on how you use it and uh, let's see we'll take that back down and I'll move it back over here and then now it even like the blue here I think I could have obviously extended it out to where the red is I didn't make the the uh, beak uh, wide enough so that would be even one little correction that since I tried to freehand it in and uh, I have to be able to catch those things what I normally do if I do a traditional watercolor or acrylic I do all my drawing on either layout paper or even tracing paper make all my corrections and erasing on that and until I get it as best as I can and study it even for a while to make sure all my proportions are the best I could get them then I would take it over to the paper or canvas or even in some cases gessoed masonite and then transfer it onto that with uh, graphite paper but with this uh, digital uh, I've even come to the conclusion and I'll put that demo up now that I'm going to do all my drawing for traditional digitally and then print them out on vellum paper and then go ahead and trace it with graphite paper onto my paper or board okay uh, let's go back down to the freehand now and I think it's going to be yeah, the most different now in this particular case what I would like to do is actually just line up the bird with a photo just to see how accurate the bird is and then I would have to make corrections on my own without the tracing of course but what I would be interested in is actually how accurate the bird is I wouldn't mind for the most part if it was a little bit higher on the branch than it is in the photo but I still would want the bird as accurate as I could get it so this case I would just grab my move tool and move the drawing down on the photo and just to see how it lines up and I could see some issues there the eye is too low uh, the beak looks like it's a little bit too low I might have made the head a little bit too rounded uh, the tail is too big and it needs to drop down some and that's when I said when I had an issue with this a while back then that would have moved the tail down a little bit and what I have to do is just study my own drawing as much as I possibly can until I'm sure as I could get that it's it's ready to go to the border paper because again transparent watercolors once you start putting paint to it you cannot readjust or re redo your proportions once you uh, pencil it out let's go ahead and start painting this out and we'll do some painting first real time and then finish this up okay for the sake of this demo I'm just going to go ahead and use my freehand drawing but I'm going to just go over real quickly how I would change it and I even cut back the pencil size a little bit I think that helped a little bit but my lines are still pretty thick now just for the interest of fixing up this drawing I could see already even without the photograph if you follow this line down and it's already on an arc coming down this way it should have been coming down right where the blue arrow is way over here and that's why I had an issue with this section here because this line is coming down but then the rest of the bird is starting up here and coming down so it's it's kind of a shift in, in the natural curve of, of uh, its wing and back and then this in here too I would have to make this bigger only because I had a decent placement of this uh, little uh, branch that's broke off here but then at the same time uh, this one right here should be coming in way over here so in other words uh, this should be almost a line and what that'll do is shorten up my leg a little bit too because it was too long and then I'm going to fix the uh, football eye and then we'll just use this drawing but I'll go ahead and do that speed drawing some of the changes I'll make will be just a selected area copy paste it to a new layer and then while that area is still selected I will erase the original layer this avoids any confusion of what my changes will actually be let's take a look okay now we could do this on multiple layers what we are going to do we'll leave our other drawings there but I'm going to go up above and start making some layers 
to paint on. We'll just start with one for now. And what we will do is wet this down. If you want to do it splashy and uh, just try to uh, really work with the watercolors, what I'm going to do first is put down a layer of water and then we are going to lock the transparency on it and then we will just be able to paint that wet area and that's it. Let's give this a shot. Okay, we're gonna place our layer of water. I'm gonna move it up, make it a little bit bigger so we can see what we're doing. I have to show wet, and that way, let's go to our water tool. We'll use that brush right there, and that's the one I use most often. Put that in. And just creating this transparent look layer of just water only, give me the opportunity to make a mask, and then also create real soft edges with using soft edge brushes to get a nice mix but I'll still be able to have a nice straight edge for the branch itself or any other straight edges that I need. I'm going to trim that down a little bit. Okay, we'll center it up. Now before I do anything else what I want to do is select the transparent lock on that layer and then now I could turn off the show wet and what I'm going to first do is just give it a real light coat of quinacridone gold that will tell me where it's at and since it's locked I can make the brush real big and it'll only give me that tan that gold right where it's at and I'm going to fast dry that quick so it doesn't move around me too much but then now what I could do is duplicate that layer over and I'm going to call this one mask and I could, then I could give it a uh, heavy coat of black, which would be right here. I'm going to use this brush real big. And then now if I go back over it with the hard black, I'll make a mask out of it. If I ever need to select that area for any reason. And then I will have both ready to go if I turn my mask off. There's my quinacridone gold rough layer just to start in. And then I'm also going to turn down my pencil drawing just so we can see the lighter colors. And that's it. Now we're ready to paint. Well, what we're going to do first is we're going to rough in uh, this the seed area, uh, all of this area right in here. But then we'll be able to protect our stems and twigs themselves uh, just to keep them away from a texture too. They may be darker or lighter. That doesn't matter. But we don't want to use the same texture in the seeds that we are on the branch so that will be another reason why we need them protected now let's go ahead and do a practice layer of how we're going to do these seeds very loose very quick very spontaneous okay now we could call this one stem branch whatever we want to do but then now we're going to make a practice layer and this will just be just for practice just to give you a rough idea I'll just leave it, leave it named layer one. And now what I'm going to do first is go back to my mask, select that. And what I will do is select the alpha area, which is a lot easier. Because this is actually the area we're going to be working on anyway. So now my black area that you see now will be protected. And I could turn the black off just so I could see what I'm doing. And then go back to my practice layer. And this is how we're going to make uh, this particular pattern uh, that it will be very loose and we're going to leave the water do everything okay we'll make it a little bit bigger so we can see what we're doing here and then what we're going to do is use a lot of water back to our watercolor brush and then we are going to use the splash texture and again these brushes are available on the free assets page on the escape motions uh, but remember these brushes will only work if you're doing this kind of effect so uh, you could use this particular effect to create other textures, but it's going to be mainly this combination of brushes for this right here. Okay, now what we want to do is we're going to start with our quinacridone gold. A lot of water. Just a little bit of color for now. And then I'm going to create my pattern. And I'm going to keep on fast drying while I'm doing this so I don't get too much movement within the quinacridone gold itself. And then there is our, so then you could see uh, darker and lighter shapes within that quinacridone gold. Otherwise, it would just even all out and make one flat color. 
if I didn't fast dry it uh, rather quickly. Okay, now what I'll do is then go back with my red. Now this is where it gets a little bit less critical what colors you want because you're going to have a lot of watercolor movement. So you'll still have the red. And then I'm going to use the sharp splash. And then now if I take this over it, what I want to do first is make sure my rewet is on 10 and my edge darkening is on 10. That's what's going to really give an exaggeration of this effect. And that's what I want. Now if I put my red down, uh, first I want to put the uh, transparent lock on. So it, the color only goes down where the gold is. And then now if I put down my red, it's going to start lifting up that gold and carrying it off just like that. Now that texture is roughly what I need. Now I could keep going back and forth on it, but this is what I'm looking for. But then keep in mind what happens is when the paint carries off to the edges, some of these dark edges, like right in here, it's carrying it down to the white paper. So if I want these to remain red, then what I will do is leave some of this red here, leave some of the quinacridone gold there, and then create another layer on top of this one to create the same effect, but with my darker colors. This way, when the darker colors move to the outside edges of those cauliflower shapes, because that's what they're called, cauliflower, what it would do then is instead of moving out to reveal the white of the paper, they'll move out to reveal the color of the layer below them. Let's try a couple more here just to show you, and then we're going to go ahead and do this in a, in a speed drawing type way since we know how to do it now. Let's go up here and put uh, some more red in, and we'll make it a real bold red because this is going to be the underlying layer. And now you can see the texture in here moving, but then if I don't fast dry it quick, it's going to change a lot. And then if I see something I like right away, I want to definitely fast dry it so it doesn't change. I'll fast dry that. But then there's some interesting shapes that you'll get. And again, remember that these shapes will never be reduplicated. So if you see an effect or a shape you like, you better fast dry and save it. And then even save it as a separate version, just in case you ever want to go back to it. Or you can always copy paste it. Uh, since we are using digital, take advantage of the digital options. Now let's go back to quinacridone gold one last time. And uh, even, uh, you know what, let's go back to the potter's pink. We're going to try that color. And then I'm going to keep my hand on the fast dry. That's it. That's where I'll stop it. Now, I have a lot of effects there, a lot of shapes. But then now let's go ahead and do our dark colors over this. Just to see what we get, we'll do the exact same thing. But with dioxazine purple, permanent magenta, and Prussian blue. We'll make one last new layer, and we'll just leave it layer two. And then now we'll do the same thing. What we'll do is start off with permanent magenta, which will just be a little bit darker version of the red. And then I want to go back to my splash texture, and I'm going to go back and then create that same effect. And I got to make sure I put enough of this down. Nothing's happening right now. And then again, I want to fast dry that right away just to keep various splotches of the purple there. And then now I want to put the transparent lock on that layer. Now if I go back with my dioxazine purple, or let's actually even go with the sepia. And then I'm going to go back to my splash texture. And now if I start putting sepia, here's my dark colors. And let that move. And then now let's go to the Prussian blue. And I'll stop it there. This will give you a rough idea what we'll end up with once we do our final textures and let's do you know what we can also do is just take clear water straight into it and it's the same thing the splash brush take it up a little bit but if i put clear water in it i won't be making it any darker but i'll be looking for additional movement there we go we got a little bit up here there there that's not too bad we'll stop there We'll see what that does. And what we could do is now uh, just uh, eliminate our lines and then see what we got. And once we get that kind of a texture, 
that's not looking too bad and then we'll finish up our stems put some lighter and darker little short stems here and there and we created that texture rather quickly let's go ahead and do the final version we'll leave the sample practice layers there we'll just make new ones for the finals and then we'll also go ahead and complete, uh, complete the stem and then uh, finish the bird okay just a couple quick notes here right now the stem looks like it's floating above uh, the rest of the uh, top itself but what what will happen is once we start darkening all these up and start making them towards the the values of the uh the cauliflower shapes then that's what will push the stems back in and make it look like it's a part of the plant otherwise right now it's just floating above and then also i might have went a little bit too dark in some places now i'm going to try and limit my dark shapes and colors and areas a little bit more when i make the final well, let's go ahead and make our final shape but we'll just do that speed painting i went ahead and made a separate layer for some of the foreground fruit this way they won't be affected by the cauliflower wash. I'm planning on making several washes over and over. Every time I use water on these layers, it changes. I can keep on going to a certain extent until I get what I like. Now working with the foreground fruit, I'm adding some snappy color to them and then eventually I will add some texture to them with a very subtle eraser. Working with the bird, I went ahead and made a mask for it. I will need it later to take out the sky. I personally like to work with selected areas and then erase out the background. This prevents any kind of paint buildup near a selected area. That is also in the demo, controlling the paint and how to avoid that. But first, I want to show the Rebel 4 and Rebel 5 users, if there's anybody out there that still have that version, on how to make a duplicate layer in case you want to erase, because that is what I'll be doing here. Okay, I just want to take a quick moment just to go over uh, how it was grouping the layers for the benefit of Rebel 4 and Rebel 5 users. If you're still using that version, that's fine but there is no layer masks. So what I was doing was grouping them and then this way I will have a backup copy of all my individual layers in case I start erasing and making any permanent changes. So in other words, all of these are on their own individual layer. Black, the green, the blue, the red, and the yellow. If I turn off black, then it's gone. If I turn off green, then it's gone. Now my point is, if I want to just say for example if I like the green yellow and red where they're at now and I know I don't want to make any changes to those particular layers then I could merge them and make them final and then start erasing them but an erase is a permanent change so what I would do is take the green the red I'm holding the control key the red and the yellow and then I will duplicate them down here at the very bottom right here at the bottom where it says duplicate then I will duplicate those and then while each copy of each layer is selected I will go ahead and merge those which is right here down at the bottom of the very right I will merge those and then now that is a layer of all three together and then I would go back to my green yellow and red while I'm holding the control key hit control G and merge those into a group and now I could turn that group off and now I have one layer of all three colors together whatever they may have been on that layer or I should say layers uh, then that would be all on one layer now and this way if I make any erasing or anything and it turns out that I'm not happy with it I could go back to my group and open them up and and redo uh, the particular layer itself uh, especially if I'm not going to move these layers anywhere then they will obviously match up exactly uh, where the previous layer was let's move on okay let's take a quick look and see what we got I went back and forth with the sumac and uh, just left the colors blend and bleed a little bit more and it softened up some of the edges just gave some really interesting shapes 
and then the uh, fruit itself is actually on its own layer so it, it wasn't uh, affected at all and then the stem itself I went ahead and roughed it in I could still put some more detail to it maybe a little bit more snappy color and then just some some harder edges with script work and then the bird will be next the sky is just a slight wash I, I just kind of like it the way it is just real simple but just it has that slight watery color look to it so I might just leave it the way it is and then we'll do the bird and then we'll see what we got at the end okay I'm gonna do a few more things here to the just the the sumac itself up in here we'll make the berries darker uh, but first we're gonna work on the bird and we'll find a very easy way to make all of the berries darker and give us some options there too and then I'm gonna go back in and erase some of these areas in here of just a little bit more of the fruit itself uh, just like these over here some of the real whitish tan ones the, just to add a little bit more complexity uh, to those somewhat uh, open areas and then this way right now we're going to work on the bird uh, so what we'll do is go down to the finch and turn on the mask and I'm going to select it and now we could turn the mask off and then we'll just go to the first layer and we are ready to paint okay before we start the bird we have one last detour we got to take care of and that is if we zoom in on this bird a lot of these feather patterns and lines are very soft uh, they're just hunks of color we don't want to go any more than that we're not going to do a real detailed bird so we're just going to make it hunks of color but to do that we have to have very specific settings so what we are going to do is uh, we're going to make a practice layer we'll just make that the practice layer And the best thing to do with this kind of work is to keep all your settings uh, very consistent. In other words, your visual settings, if you're going to do this and make changes with their water and amount of paint, then keep these the same. If you start changing everything, then you'll never get a consistent end result. So we're going to turn these down to about two. That is the rewet and the edge darkening. Uh, in fact, the edge darkening, I'm going to turn it all the way down to zero. And the rewet, I'm going to take down to zero too. And I'll show you why. What we're going to do is we're going to put different amounts of water in the paint on an already wet surface. And what that will do is allow the paint to bleed out and soften the edge, even if it starts out with a straight hard edge let's try this now right now we are on the practice layer we're going to wet the whole layer we'll verify that the bird is wet and now what we will do is go up and let's go to a we could start off and help ourselves out by just a uh, soft brush to begin with and that would be this one here we're going to take it way down in size about right there and then the opacity we're going to put up just a little bit but the water we're only going to put up to like maybe 20. And we're going to start this at a couple of different amounts of water just to see our end results because keep in mind this also has to do with the speed of your machine uh, how big you're working so let's go with uh let's try some uh, just some uh quinacridone gold like up in here and if I start making some lines, and then if I turn it up a little wee bit more, because this is a soft edge, uh, let's just go right here. And then if we put these lines down and then just leave it, now you see how it's feathering out? Now we have to control that, uh, how much we want it to feather out. So if we think this is going too fast, and it's happening too fast, uh, then maybe we might want to cut the water down a little bit, because the drier the paint, the slower that will react I'll put it down to 10 and then now we'll try it and now see it's going a lot slower so this is more handleable in the sense that we don't have to uh, fast dry really quick now then if it goes too slow or if it's not soft enough then you may have to adjust your water and this all depends on your brush too 
and there we'll get our patches of color uh, just like these over here like in here like in here anywhere there's a darker patch of color but it has a soft edge and to make them look like feathers or just a, a loose painting you can see the difference uh, between uh, this amount of water in the color and this amount of water in the color so that's what we're going to be watching on any of these colors we use in the bird or even on the stem or anywhere that if I have a lot of water it's going to mix quick uh, but if I start cutting back my water if I put completely dry paint down uh, one last try we'll change the color we'll put down red because it's a practice layer anyway if I put down red it's not going to go anywhere and again all of this is in the controlling the paint uh, in one of the previous demos I did that even though this is a wet surface if I put a dry completely dry paint on a wet surface it's not going to go anywhere it will not mix at all so keep these things in mind and then if you don't fast dry it this one's still blending out and they'll be blending out too but just much much slower so until you hit the fast dry then it'll finally stop it but then it will keep the uh, the bird or your work area itself whatever you're doing because keep in mind uh, these principles are for any subject matter you use in any style uh, not just uh, what I'm trying to do here let's go ahead and start painting in the bird okay we could do a little bit of real-time painting here I'll take the size of the bird down but leave it fairly big so we can work on it and then I am going to turn off the practice layer and then we will just go ahead and make our first painting layer and then now we could do one of a couple different things here. We could leave it uh, with the selection area or you can even just uh, coat it with water first and then use a transparency lock. Or you can even just paint it freehand and not use any kind of a, a protected area system. Let's go ahead and give it a coat of water because what I'm going to do is uh, give it a coat of water but then that way I'm going to blend some colors. And that's more or less what's called kill the white uh, coating of just where you blend in some real soft light colors just to get you started as a base coat more or less but now all we could do is just take our water brush and just take a big brush because it's protected and I'm just going to go ahead and put on the show wet we're gonna give all this a coat of water just to leave some colors blend in and then now I could turn that off and I'll just use the protected area it already has and then what I will do is start dropping in my colors it looks like a little bit of uh, raw umber and I will use cobalt blue uh, to make those neutral grays but then I'm gonna start off real light because there's some pretty light patches here and there and I'm gonna just dust them on with the Kleenex brush just a little wee bit of color but lots of water so feathers out good and I want to make sure now if I want the rewet on and the edge darkening on even at five is going to give me a lot of hard edges and I don't want that so I'm going to take those all the way down to nothing zero and then now this will give me real soft transitions from one color to another let's start off with a little bit of yellow like right in here a little bit of quinacridone gold maybe even possibly a slight tinge of orange that that would be overpainted anyway but it's still there trace of so I'm just gonna put a little wee bit of orange right here and then that's it and leave that go and then what this will do and if I use the raw umber I'm gonna take the opacity down even more just a little bit and then I'll leave this blend in with some blue and one big thing I want to notice while I'm doing this right now is the fact that this is an old picture probably one of the oldest photographs I have that'll blend out it should because I have the rewet off and then what what I want to say about this is this is one of the oldest photographs I have uh, for my collection this was taken back in the mid 80s point being is it is actually uh, Kodachrome 64 meaning that these real hard shadows filmed back then didn't have much of what was called a latitude uh, meaning from the lightest to the darkest area and because this was photographed in the sun if you noticed up in here some of the shumac itself 
it actually has just about pure black in the shadowed areas on a bright sunny day the only thing that would be pure black is black in a shadowed area so even then if it's a glossy object it might have reflected colors on it so again this is where you have to correct a photograph okay let's see uh, we're going to put in now some uh let's start off with the permanent rose and just to give us a hint of where those colors are going to be and again we're going to try and make this fairly loose i can put the pencil drawing back on give me an idea where everything's going to be and that would be and let's see then i can even the, the eye is going to be really dark, so I don't have to worry about that. But some of these lighter areas, and again, remember, I'm doing this uh, for the sake of Rebel 4 and 5 users also. So I'm going to erase instead of using a mask, because either one will give you the same end result. But using a mask will definitely help you as far as not having to make a permanent change. Now, just a little wee bit of cobalt violet over that umber, and I'll get a neutral gray. But we're going to leave it mix. And that's it, and then I'm not going to go... I'll go dark, but I don't, I don't want to go black. We're going to lighten that up a little bit, the shadowed area, but we'll still make it a subtle shadowed area. Now, that's blocked in. And then again, uh, since we're erasing, I could go back in, save some of these layers, but then go back in and erase out uh, some highlights here and there because that would be the same in traditional as either using an exacto knife to scrape uh, or a wet brush to scrub out colors if you use good watercolor paper you could easily do that without destroying the paper okay next speaking of erasing that's what I'm gonna do next I'm gonna pull out some of these highlights right in here and I'm just gonna erase them out and then that way once I create those light spaces they'll stay there even if I take a color over top of them, the, the, the contrast might reduce a little bit, but that lighter color area will always be there towards paper. So we're going to go up to our eraser. We're going to grab a real soft brush. And I'm going to go ahead and erase some out. I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. And I just want to take a little bit of time out. About right in here. And then keep in mind, I'm erasing and I'm just drawing so remember I always say painting is nothing more than drawing with color so you'll feel as comfortable painting it freehand as you will drawing it out freehand and these could change by taking darker colors back over top of them but we're just going to start putting some texture in just start mark marking off some of our areas that we're going to want lighter and then one more right in here and then we could sh dark shadow this backside on the right right in here shadow it even darker and then this side will stay even light and usually if you could give yourself if you're just starting out in painting if you could give yourself three different values that's not too bad light medium dark and obviously we're just painting now in a negative kind of way But I'm going to do some of this real time and then we'll go off to speed painting to finish it up and then we'll talk about what we have. Of course, we're going to do a little bit of real time here. Okay, I made it a little bit bigger so we can see what we're doing here. And then also, I'm going to go up with my mop wet brush. Uh, again, all those brushes are available, free O charge. Uh, I'm going to start off with about a 14 size, opacity 10. And the water is about 15, and again, we got to make sure we're going to turn these off. Just so I get nice, even blend of color to color. We're going to start laying some of the red. We'll put some heavy red in. And just, uh, we could go up in opacity for this one, because that red is very dark. Up in here, and we'll see how fast it blends. A little bit dry right now, but that's okay. It's going to feather out with the water. I gotta do this fast. I'm gonna leave a little white space there between the eye and this red patch. And that goes down a little bit rounded right here. 
that's it we'll leave that blend stop and then what I'm doing is just my base color still that I'm gonna redefine it more and more but then what we're gonna do is just patches and then let's put in some grays we could start uh, shadowing I'm gonna take it down a little bit right in here we'll mix these in with some blue if it needs it just here and there and this is just a quickly render and I'm hitting a fast drive fairly quick and I could probably take some of this gray down into our shadowed area that will be the lighter colors in shadow anyway leave that blend a little bit that softens it up quite a bit from the original brush stroke mark uh, up in here a little bit of gold in there I see and we can pull out some real strong highlights if we want to later I'm just taking a little bit at a time darker just to give me some room to do whatever I want oh I accidentally hit my And again, I'm just drawing these all out as I paint, just to give you a rough idea. Once we have our stop, that didn't take long at all. And then right in here is the top of the wing. So I'm going to go ahead and put in a rough patch of darker areas where it's at. But I'm going to redefine these edges a little bit sharper, like right in here where the actual wing is. But this is such a pose that you could barely see any of the wings. And this is just quick strokes and leaving them blend. But I want to break it up a little bit. I don't want to just create solid colors in this particular instance. Again, there's numerous endless ways you could do this. Get the fast dry. And right under the gold is right here. And I use traditional colors, so you may want to mix your own colors, use any of the 16 million colors, however you want to do it. And that is for anything that you paint, not necessarily just a bird. Okay, let's take that back, and that will be a start. We could put in some darker colors right in here, break that up right there a couple right here and we'll do the same thing with the permanent rose and maybe a little bit of red and then in the shadows areas we can put just a touch of the permanent magenta and again the, these shadings here you can still let them blend the way they do as an optical mix meaning that you can put all these on a separate layer if you want to have a little room that if you make a mistake or whatever keep them on separate layers and you'll be able to redo it and it'll still blend out if the layers wet just like it is now but you'll just be able to change it without changing your base coat or affecting your base coat okay let's see what we got there okay just to give you a rough idea of overlapping layers we'll go ahead and make another layer and then we'll just call it paint two and I'm gonna go ahead and start putting in some more permanent rows and then just a little bit of red and then we'll go ahead and fix up this top make some changes here and there but we got a nice soft feather pattern started already and you can tell how much time it took me to do that since I did it in real time let's put some more rows down but then we'll be able to control this since it's on a separate layer again like I said but again we have to wet the layer completely first so it blends out nice I gotta make sure these are still down yes they are and then now all we have to do is use the same amount of paint and water roughly we could go a little bit darker if we want but we're gonna just make some sketches here and there let's make it a little bit bigger okay just to see what we're doing that's one nice advantage about digital and I will keep my finger on the F button quick dry and I cut the size of the brush down just so I could 
press a little bit harder. That might be too much. If these patches of color get a little bit too soft, I could go back in and just pull out some highlights with the eraser. This will give me the opportunity to add some detail in an indirect kind of way. I could also make some areas darker to create more detail. Okay, let's take some of these areas darker. If we make them too dark, in digital there are plenty of options to make any specific area lighter. If it's the entire layer, you could just change the opacity of the layer. If you need certain areas lightened up, you could either go back in and indirectly add some sharp lines to create some detail, or just go back over with a light soft edge eraser. Now just to add some deep shadows on the legs, I, got, I used the uh, Potter's Pink just to get me started on the highlighted areas. Now I'm going to put in some real dark areas along the top edges of the legs, but then I'm going to let it blend in real quick. I can't spend too much time waiting. This is just straight sepia, so as long as I leave the color wet, I could go back in with blue. Now just a quick note right here, right in here where this middle toe crosses this toe on the right here, I made a sharp line but then dried it real quick just so that line stays sharp and then went back over it again with some more paint and left that bleed out. So I wanted a sharp edge on the right side but a soft edge on the left side. Let's see what we got here now. And we may be able to go to some speed painting just to finish up the bird. But that should give you a rough idea what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. And just to pull this bird together. And then as long as anything and everything is wet, I could still take my cobalt blue over the brown and let it mix in a little bit and wait a while. In some cases, there are plenty of uh, warm browns, uh, what I would call either a raw umber or a light burnt umber uh, in the bird itself. We'll put the eye beak in. Those things are going to be all more or less dry paint with a little bit of mixing. And that's about it. And then we got to do the stem and everything else yet. We'll go ahead and get some done speed painting. I went ahead and put more detail in than I originally planned. I couldn't resist. With the traditional watercolor though, it's a little bit different than opaque paints. You have to paint around your highlights. Or if it's a fairly light color in the painting, it's actually just the white of the paper one or two quick washes and then that's it you're done you can't really do too much more to those areas unless you start having the pool color back out one way or another in traditional i use gesso for subtle highlights because it will hold one layer of additional color on top of that white i didn't put too much detail in the stem i stopped short of it just to have more focus on the bird now obviously with digital we could do things any way we want and keep various versions of it. I strongly suggest to try and paint different versions of your same drawing for practice and just to give you something to pick from of what effect or technique you like best. Let's take a look. Okay, let's take a look and see what we have. Uh, this particular bird, I just call it finished for demo purposes. It'll just give you a good idea trying to show you a different multiple ways of achieving the same effect in the steps along the way. But one thing I would like to show you, again, from painting from photographs, and that's one thing I haven't mentioned yet. Again, when I said that I photographed this with a 300-2.8 and a 1.4x converter, that's about 420 millimeter. Now, what I mean by that is a telephoto that strong has a very limited depth of field, especially when I photographed this bird. These birds are only a few inches high, and I was only about eight or nine feet away from this bird working out of a blind when I photographed it. Now, what's my point? Well, in the photograph, you could see that even though the tail is only about two to maybe two and a half inches into the photograph, it's already out of the depth of field. This photograph kind of works only because the sumac is in the same plane as the eye. So everything here is going to appear sharp focus, whereas everything to start going away and into the picture is already going to fall out of focus. Now that's something we could correct in a painting or illustration. Even this branch right here is going back into the photo, so it's already getting soft compared to these sharp edges up in here. And again, uh, that could be improved uh, from a photograph. It's just another simple reference and a tool to work from 
to help you build something together along the way. Now, what we'll do is just wrap this one up. And again, if you find any value out of these demos or any help at all, please hit the subscribe button and the like button. And then by all means, if you have any questions on any of the effects or techniques I've worked on in this particular demo or any other demo, uh, feel free to comment and I will answer your comments. Like I always say, until I see you out in the field or back at the studio, Thanks for watching.